Morning. It's so good to be with all of you this morning. As we get started, I just wanted to take a moment and read from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in his accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the ones he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. This morning, we worship in that goodness, in the truth of God's goodness and grace. And as we worship, would you just think about that this morning? Would you stand as we get ready to worship this morning? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all. Takes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. His amazing grace. Would you continue worshiping with us this morning as we sing this next song? I 
search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures of fate are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together.
Heavenly Father, we do ask that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that you would make us aware of your presence this morning. And that we would take the rest of this time as we worship together, as we hear from you. To see you, to recognize you, to see where you are moving in our lives, where you are calling us out of our comfort zones and calling us out to be the people that we are as your people in the kingdom of God. And we thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to be in your presence and to worship you, to be with your people this morning. We thank you. We pray all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Aaron was going to share something, but is he here? All right. There he is. He's in the back. All right. It's all right. I'm going to blame that on the worship being really good. I lost, mm -hmm. lost my place. Well, we did 30-hour famine here this weekend, and I am so proud of the teens that came out to do that. Uh, if you don't know what 30-hour famine is, it's, uh, it's an event that, uh, that we do through, third, uh, through World Vision, uh, which is a global um, ministry that, that helps people that are living in poverty. And so we partner with, 30, with World Vision to fast for 30 hours and raise money, and we send that money into World Vision. So the idea is that we go hungry so others can eat. And so the teens came uh, 6 o'clock on Friday, but began fasting at noon on Friday. And we fasted from noon until 6 p.m. Saturday. And during that time, we come together, we learn more about, about poverty and, uh, and, and the, need, the, the need all around the world um, through these videos and lessons that come through, um, through World Vision. So it's a really great weekend. It helps us understand and, and put our our feet in the shoes of people that, that live uh, below the poverty line, which is trying to understand the realities that they face every day is, is just an incredible journey. So uh, I'm thankful for, for World Vision and what they do, and I'm thankful for all the teens that came out. We had eight teens that came out. Um, if you came to 30 Hour Family, would you stand? Um, so these are some of them. Some of them are missing. They'll be here probably at the 11 a.m. service, but these guys fasted for 30 hours, and then, of course, we had a feast last night at 6 p.m., which was great as well. But I'm, I'm proud to report that through their efforts, and none of mine, uh, they have raised over $1,000 so far. And we are going to be raising money. Thank you. Absolutely. <clears throat> According to World Vision's calculations, that's enough to feed one child for over two years, wow. or 25 children for a month. Mm. So that's significant, and that's something that you guys did. And I'm really proud of you coming to the event. There's a lot of other things they could have been doing this weekend, but they were there. Um, and that tells me that they have a faith in Christ that's willing to sacrifice for him and for others. And that I'm really proud of. Uh, we're not done fundraising. We're going to fundraise for the next week and through next Sunday. So if you want to give towards, um, towards the 30-hour famine, you still can. Um, you can see one of them. That's fine. You guys can sit down. Um, you can see one of them, or um, you can go online to our Facebook page. I believe the link is also on our, um, uh, what's it called? What a page? monthly, what's that? Newsletter, what page? Newsletter, thank you. I don't know why that word couldn't come. But thank you for, for your prayer and, and your support, and uh, thank you, teens, for, for this weekend. Amen. Thank you. Pastor for That's all right. Well, just a couple of things I want to mention. One, um, don't forget the crucial part of our worship is our giving of our tithes and offerings. So uh, we have boxes in the back that you can place your tithe and offerings on, and we are 
it's wonderful to respond. Some of us give online, a lot of us give online, and so we have to kind of consciously take uh, the thought when we see that come out of our check, checking account to remember that that is an offering to God, and uh, it is a part of our worship, a very important part of our worship. And then secondly, uh, there's also scholarships for camps that we're beginning to raise money for. You can see that on, in the board on there, and you can, if you'd like to donate to that, you can see that board and take off one of those cards uh, representing $100, and that will go for getting our kids to camps. And then baptisms are next Sunday after church, the second service at noon, around noon, uh, depending how long the preacher preaches. Um, and so if you are interested in baptizing, want baptism, want more information, just take that card out in front of you, write baptism on it, your name, and hand it to me or put it in the box, and I'll make sure I contact you about that. Now, this morning I was out there looking as people were coming in, and Bill Schultz was out there, and he was in his truck, and he was being greeted by a barking dog uh, in the parking lot. Eventually he got, you know, he's not afraid of dogs because he has dogs all over the house and stuff. Um, but I don't know this morning if you've been greeted by someone barking at you, but it is good to be greeted in the name of the Lord and to offer to someone the peace of Christ which is basically say, peace be unto you, and our response can be, and also to you. So stand for a moment, look someone in the eyes, and greet them this morning before, and remain standing because we're going to read the scripture. <laughs> peace be unto you. Okay, we're reading in 1 Peter, with verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you, revealed at his coming. And that hope, that's where our hope is ultimately set. Um, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. You may be seated. In Greek mythology, there is a um, story of a man named Sisyphus. Uh, Sisyphus was legendarily the king of, of Corinth. He was an evil and selfish king, but he was very clever. And so when the gods tried to kill him, he was so clever that he would figure out a way to avoid death time and time again. And so the gods decided to do another punishment upon Sisyphus. Uh, they would let him live forever, but would sentence him to the task of pushing a heavy rock up a steep hill so this is Sisyphus here there he is 
That's not an actual picture of him, I don't think, but that's... And every time he would get that heavy rock up to the, almost to the top of the hill, it would fall back on him and roll all the way back down. And he would have to do it again. And he would do it again. And he would do it again. And he was sentenced to an eternity of pushing that rock up that hill. Webster calls a Sisyphean task a pointless, fruitless, unrewarding task that must be repeated over and over again. Insert joke here, right? Any of you have some Sisyphean tasks that you seemingly have to do over and over again, and yet they seem pointless? Anyone have meetings that may seem pointless, and yet you have to do them over and over again? Um, there's a lot of things we could look at Sisyphean. Uh, cleaning the house seems like a task. You, you get it all cleaned, and then all of a sudden you look around, and it looks like you haven't done anything. Doing the laundry, especially if you have little kids around, seems like a Sisyphean task that keeps going on and over and over again. You get it all done, and lo and behold, the basket is full again. It just never seems to end. How home maintenance, weeding the gardens, painting the Golden Gate Bridge. The story of Golden Gate Bridge is once they get it all painted, they start again and start all over again. And it's just a non-ending, never-ending task. But some of those tasks feel Sisyphean, but they're really not. Because they may seem never-ending, but they are not pointless, right? I mean, if you stop doing the laundry... Before long, you, your family, and everyone around you will understand the point of doing the laundry and wish you would keep doing that. So it's not pointless. A true Sisyphean task is one that is absolutely meaningless. You get nothing out of it. It's no point pushing that rock up that hill over and over again, and it ends up right back in the same spot, and you, get no, you have no progress. Nothing really matters. Now, in 1942, there was a philosopher named Albert uh, Camus who wrote an essay on the myth of Sisyphus. And, and Camus was uh, greatly influenced by Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche was someone, a philosopher who wrote in the 1800s, late 1800s, and uh, Nietzsche proclaimed uh, famously that God is dead and that the philosophers have proven that God doesn't exist. And that life has therefore no meaning, no purpose, and in death everything ends, though none of it really matters. So Camus, uh, believing that way, retold the story of Sisyphus. And basically says, after Nietzsche, after we've realized that God doesn't exist, life is Sisyphean. Uh, all of life is just pushing a rock up a hill, and in the end, it really doesn't matter. We just do this. We go through life. We go through these motions. But really, in the end, it doesn't matter because death comes and death wipes away everything. And so it doesn't matter what you do. Ultimately, there is no meaning and nothing really ultimately matters. But Camus made Sisyphus the hero of the modern life, he said. Because Sisyphus knows that there's no point in all this. But he keeps on pushing that rock. He keeps on doing it, even though it is absolutely meaningless. And Camus said that we should be like Sisyphus. We should, should be happy about it. Because uh, life has no meaning, and so we have the opportunity to make meaning out of whatever we want out of life. We, we get to do whatever we want. We get to be our own God while we live, and then we die, and when we die, we're never going to have to answer for any of our choices, because this is all there is. And so he says we should recognize the meaningless of life, and then just give ourselves to life without worrying about anything, and be happy about it. It reminds me a little bit of the, when I was thinking of that, it reminded me of the, the John Lennon song, Imagine. You know, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. And, and John Lennon imagined this would be a good thing. But 
the 20th century, the century that followed Nietzsche's proclamation that God is dead and there is no meaning, was not the perfect paradise that maybe some people would imagine. It was the bloodiest century of all human history. They estimate that, that 200 million people were murdered by wars or by government officials in the 20th century, by far any more than any other century. When you, when you take meaning out of life, what do you get? And Camus realized how difficult it was to live a good life when you have absolutely no meaning in life. That's why he called Sisyphus a hero. And so he even called his teaching the philosophy of the absurd. Because he says life is absurd. Life is absurd like Sisyphus. You've got to do this thing. You go through these motions. It doesn't mean anything. But somehow you have got to create meaning out of this meaningless life. So Peter is writing this letter to Gentile Christians who lived just across the Aegean Sea from, from Greece, from Athens, from where all this, these legends came, right? The philosophers where this came. They grew up with the story of Sisyphus. Now there's no indication that Peter is thinking of Sisyphus when he's writing this letter. But this passage we read this morning could be a direct answer to, to Sisyphus and to Camus. As Peter writes to these Christians, before you came to Christ, you were following the empty way of life that was handed down from your ancestors. You were pushing that rock up that hill over and over again with no purpose, no meaning. It was empty. But now you have been redeemed, he says. Now you have been redeemed from that emptiness. You have been redeemed from that purposeless, meaningless kind of life, that absurd life. And now you have been redeemed, and life is not absurd. Now, absurd, now life is worth living because your life has redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And Peter says, not with gold or silver which can perish. Now, gold is nearly indestructible, but I guess there are some, some ways that gold can be destructed. Maybe a nuclear reaction, but, but Peter says, You have not been redeemed with gold and silver, which will perish, but you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, which will never perish. The value of your life is anchored in Christ himself, his death and resurrection, and what he did for us. Life is worth living, and it's, been, and it's, it's demonstrated that Christ died for us. God sent his son for us. Um, years ago, I heard this illustration by a youth pastor. And uh, he, he pulled out a $20 bill. And he spit on it. And he crumbled it up. And he laid it down on the floor and he stomped on it. And then he took it up and put it under his arms. And, <laughs> and then he said to the youth group, Anyone want this $20 bill? Of course, they all raised their hands. Now, I was going to do that illustration today, but on Easter, I lost 20 bucks, so I didn't want to do it again. I only have so many $20 I want to give away. Um. <laughs> but, but he asked them, why did you, why do you still want this? I mean, look how I def defiled it. And you still want it? And they said, yes, because it's still worth $20. Its value has not changed no matter all the things that you've done to it. And, it, and its value is not in paper, not in the quality of paper. It's not in the way it looks. Its value is backed by the U.S. government, which, by the way, is a country that produces one-fourth of the global wealth every year for the last decades, many decades. That's why the dollar is so valuable. Peter says our value but it is not based in the U.S. government, not based even in silver or gold. Our value is based in the precious blood of Christ. Jesus gave his life for us. The Father sent his Son to die for us. That is how much our life matters. That is how meaningful life is. It is so meaningful that 
Jesus died for us. And when we think our life doesn't matter, and when we think our life has no value, we are saying something about the blood of Christ, Peter says. When you feel like no one cares for you, you are saying something about the sacrifice that Jesus gave. He loves you. I love the song, uh, one of my favorite um, Christmas songs is one that's hard to sing, but it's a beautiful song, Oh Holy Night, right? And I love it when I hear someone be able to sing that well, with all those high notes. But the, but the song, part of the song says, Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. And then that second verse connects it all to that. It says, Change shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression will cease. Why? Because Jesus Christ has demonstrated the worth of every single person. Because he died for us. The precious blood of Christ shows what the worth of a human is. Christian teaching elevated the human soul in a way that we don't fully understand. Uh, for centuries, I mean, since the birth of Christ, since the coming of Christ, Christian teaching began to elevate the soul. And it didn't matter whether you were rich or poor, whether you were a king or a slave, it didn't make a difference. As Romans says, Christ died for all. Therefore, every single person has infinite value in Christ. So chain shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name oppression will seek because every person matters. And so your life matters. Uh, don't ever say no one cares. God showed how much he cares. Our lives are not meaningless. We are redeemed from the empty way of life. We have a life of meaning and purpose. We have a life of substance. And there is a word in the Bible that that describes that life of substance, that life of meaning, that life of purpose. And it is a word that Peter used. It is the word holy. It describes what it means to live a life of worth and value, to live a life of holiness. Peter contrasts the empty way of life versus the holy life. That is the contrast. As he says, quoting Leviticus, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. A holy is used over 800 times in the Bible. It is used more times than the word love. And, and, and the angels around the throne, uh, we know from Scripture, sing, holy, holy, holy. That is their response to God. Holy, holy, holy. The Hebrew word for holy is the word Kadesh. And there's a couple of, uh, a couple of definitions for Kadesh. Scholars have studied the word Kadesh in, in the etymology from where it came from. And they come up, they, they debate about this, which one is the essence of where the root word Kadesh comes from. But these are the two that they've determined. One of these two is the essence. The one is, the first one is to be set apart, to be separate. And the second one is, is, is glorious, brilliant, splendor, beauty. And those two are, they say, they, the word Kadesh, holy, comes from those. And we certainly can put them together, among others. But that, those two things. And so first of all, the idea of set apart, when the angels say, holy, 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 what they are saying is that. They are saying, God, you are different from anything else. You are different. You are separate. You are wholly other, a totally different category. I mean, you are not the greatest of all time, not like, you know, Michael Jordan or Wayne Gretzky, uh, who, who, are, who may be the greatest hockey player or basketball player. That means you are the top among others. No, God, you are, you are the only one on the list. There's no other God. There's no other one that fits in that category. Nothing in creation is like you. You are totally separate from creation, and you are different than anything that we experience. You are holy. And no one is like you. And when we sing holy, we say, we are not you. <laughs> There's, 
There's a gap between who you are and who we are. You are holy. You are the holy one. And it means that I don't get to determine who you are. Because I, to be holy, I have to be like you. I don't get to determine who you are. Moses had that experience. Remember Moses, uh, the Lord, Mo, Lord told Moses he was going to call him to this tremendous task of leading the children of Israel. And immediately Moses says, well, tell me your name. What is Moses wanting? He says, I need to know who you are. And what did God say? He said, I will be who I will be. I am who I am. Don't go thinking, Moses, you can put me in a little box and define me. I am not going to be an idol that you get to fashion however you want. And that's what the ancients would do. They would take an idol. They would create an idol that would represent a god. This is who God, this is what God is, right? This idol. And down at the, at the, at the foot of Mount Sinai, the children of Israel made golden calves and said, this is who God is. But when we say holy, we, we recognize that. No, I don't get to fashion God in the image that I want. And that is part of the reason that no one could ever describe what God looked like. Because he is indescribable. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 6, when the angels are surrounding the throne, one of the things the angels do, they have six wings. Weird, six wings, right? Well, there's a purpose for the six wings. They need two to fly, but they have two to cover their feet because their feet are polluted and their, their feet are mortal, not God. Not that's polluted, but they are mortality. But they also have two wings that cover their eyes. I'm basically saying we cannot fully grasp who you are you are God you are holy to be holy means that God is God and we let him be God and he reveals himself the way he chooses to reveal himself the essence of sin is idolatry when we make our God uh, make our own God rather than worship God who is uh, the essence of sin is when we don't acknowledge the distinction between us and God. And so John in his epistle says, no one has ever seen God. <laughs> and that brings us to the idea of glory. When people saw God, they really, and they reported on it, when we reported in Revelations or Isaiah, or we reported on people experiencing God's presence, it is his presence that he experienced. It is his glory that they experience. It is the radiance of God coming out. They don't see God, they see his glory. Mostly it's described like brilliant light, as Ezekiel described it. And when Moses wants to see God, he doesn't say, I want to see God. He doesn't say that. He says, show me your glory. I need to see your glory. That's all I can see. We, holy God, we can't, we only see the glory of God. And even then, it was too great. God had to put him in a cave and cover him and said, I'll just pass my, my glory will pass by you and you'll get a glimpse of it. But you can't take all the glory of God. And so that's part of what makes John chapter 1, verse 14 so powerful, right? One of my favorite verses in the Bible. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Talking about Jesus coming into the world. And we have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I mean, that powerful passage. That's why it was a bit, uh, a, a, a bit almost heretical to some of the Jews. The glory of God is going to encompass one person in Jesus Christ. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And in Jesus, we see the glory of God. And so we are called to live in his glory. We are called to live in his radiance, in his beauty, in his presence. That, that's 
glory. It is that all those words kind of fit for this word of glory. Glory in the Hebrew is the word kavod, and, and, it, and it, it means heavy in its essence. It means something that is substantial and heavy, and that's really important. It contrasted between the idols, which were lightweight, which were empty, which had no substance, which were meaningless and vain, hebel, in, 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 as Ecclesiastes would talk about. It's empty, no substance to it. But God is the very substance of creation. God is the very foundation of everything that ever exists. He has substance to him. He is heavy. He has glory. He, is, he has weight. The idols are weightless, empty. C.S. Lewis described uh, in The Great Divorce people going from hell to heaven in a bus trip, basically taking a bus trip. And they leave from, 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 from hell, and as they get closer to heaven, they realize that those people are so solid, while they themselves are very thin, like ghosts almost. C.S. Lewis understood the word glory. It's substance. There's something meaning to it there's something purposeful to it and so we experience as we experience the glory of christ in our lives we are transformed paul says that so well uh second corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 and we who with unveiled faces contemplate meditate reflect upon the lord's glory and are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The Spirit in us continues to transform us from one degree of substance to a deeper degree of substance, one degree of meaning to a deeper sense of meaning, one sense of glory to a deeper sense of glory. The beauty of God, Christ, sheds on our heart, and we begin to live this weighted, substantive, glorious life in Christ. And so that's all that Paul is saying. You guys once lived empty life, vain life, emptiness, meaningless lives. Nothing really mattered. But you've been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And no longer do you lead a Sisyphean life where you're just going through the motions and nothing really makes a difference how you live. Doesn't really matter. You can create your own meaning, whatever you want. No, that's not you anymore. You now live a life of holiness because you have been transformed by the glory of God. A life of beauty, a life of purity, a life of love. As the Apostle Paul talks about, the Spirit gives us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and a sound, disciplined mind. Just feel the solidness there, the groundedness going there. So now all of life has meaning and substance. Everything we do has meaning and purpose based in Christ. It matters how we live. So Peter says, be holy, for I am holy, for God is holy. Most of the times we read that passage and we think of a negative term. Usually we think of holiness kind of in the negative term, unfortunately, because we think of dour saints who are always grumpy or something, or we think of all the lists of things we're not allowed to do, and that becomes the idea of holiness. But that is not holiness. Holiness is a positive, this is a positive command. Be holy is a positive command. It's very similar to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, be perfect. And we look at that and say, that's terrible. But don't we understand what he's really saying? Follow me and I can, I can bring fullness to your life. You can actually be a holy person transformed. Our lives being holy is the most optimistic, hopeful message we can hear. We can live a life that looks like Christ himself. And so Peter says several things about this holy life, and we're just going to kind of touch on a few as we close. First of all, he says, we are to live as foreigners. We are to live as foreigners. We have to recognize that we have to be different. The holiness means that we are different. We, we, we are different in the right way. Some people are different in the wrong way, you know. But we are different not, in, not by being self-righteous, or, or, uh, but, but the difference comes through the glory of God radiating through my life. 
Haven't you seen some people who demonstrate such love of Christ, such grace in their life, that you just look at them and say, man, what is different about them? In the early church, um, their, their ability to love was one of the things that made them different. Peter talks about that down at the end, doesn't he? Now that you have been transformed by love, now love each other deeply. That demonstration of love was, a, was not something that we have on our own. This is love, not that we love God or that we love others. This is love, that God loved us. And then we are transformed by his love so that we live differently. We live a holy life. And so we are called to be different. We are called because our lives, life matters. What we do matters. Uh, Peter says, we are to live in the reverent fear of knowing that we will appear before the Father. And again, that, that sounds, you know, since you, here's literally, he says, since you call on a father who judges each person's work and partially live out your times as foreigners here in reverent fear, our lives matter. And, and we look at that negative, but it's not negative. It is absolutely positive again. Our lives matter, and we will give an account for how we live. That is a good thing. When things matter, we hold people accountable, right? If it doesn't matter, someone gives you a task to do and they don't care about it and they never check up on you, then pretty soon you get the idea that it really doesn't matter. And you can mess up and they don't care, eh, well, whatever. But that is not it. Our lives matter. And the ultimate devaluing of our life is says that it does not matter and we are never going to have to give an account for this life, this wonderful life that we have been given in Christ. Peter says, no, we, we live with this recognition that there is coming that day. That's where our hope is when Christ is revealed. That's also where our, our motivation is. We look forward to that day where we will stand before the Father and we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. We fall. But we keep, as Paul says, we keep forgetting what is behind and keep moving on toward what, ahead, what is ahead, knowing one day we are going to stand before the Father. Our lives matter. And finally, Peter says, I say finally, but this is the first thing he said. I'm kind of coming back to it. We need to keep our minds alert and fully sober. Literally, the, the, the Greek is, uh, gird the loins of your mind. <laughs> it's the old expression that meant a lot to them. The idea of you were, when you were wearing a robe, men wore robes back then. And, and if they were getting ready to go fight in a battle, they would have to gird their loins meant they pulled up their robe and stuck it inside their belt so that they could run. The idea is that gird the loins of your mind, prepare your mind for battle, prepare your mind for action, prepare your mind, keep your minds alert. We live in a culture that is going to say all kinds of things that is contrary to who God is. We live in a culture that is just going to push us down a certain way and tell us that things don't matter that matter. That there, is, that there are things teaching us this, this meaningless kind of life. Do whatever you do. Create your own future. Create, create whoever you want to be. But Peter says, no, we acknowledge that God is holy. We are not holy. Only our holiness comes from God. And Romans says that when we refuse to acknowledge God as God, our thinking becomes empty. And so that's what we're called to do. We're called to remind ourselves of who God is and to live in His presence. And we don't want our thinking to become empty. We don't want our lives to become empty. We don't want a life ended with a kind of a Sisyphean life where life doesn't matter. Peter teaches us the value of our life uh, established in Christ and demonstrated in our holy way of living, which constantly says that what we do every day, it matters. We're going to close and sing a hymn. Kylie's going to come and help us. But you know, this past Thursday was the 24th anniversary of the Columbine school shooting. And it was kind of the first, not the first school shooting. It was certainly, the, at that time, the, the worst 
and it kind of set off what seems to be a constant happening way too often. But Eric Harris was one of the shooters there, and he wrote in his diary or journal or whatever, he wrote before he committed that atrocity these words. He said, the human race isn't worth fighting for, it's only worth killing. It's kind of that meaningless kind of response. Peter says, every single life has meaning. Every single life matters. How do we live a life that matters? How do we live a life of worth? It is living a holy life through the power of God, being transformed by the glory of Christ day by day. N.T. Wright said this, has this beautiful analogy. He says, we are like angled mirrors. We reflect the glory of God and we angle it out to the world. And that is our calling. The glory of God shines in our life and imperfect as we are, we allow him to transform us so that others can see the glory of God. Someone else said, we are called to be a thermostat, not a thermo thermometer. We come into a room and we set the temperature by our spirit. The glory of God transforms us and we reflect God to the world. C.S. Lewis says this, how little people think that holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, and perhaps you, like you, I've only met it once, it is irresistible. He says, if even 10% of the world's population had true holiness, would not the whole world be converted and happy before a year's end? So we long for to be transformed by the holiness of the Lord. Let's stand, sing this hymn as we, uh, as we close. God himself, the God of peace, 
sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless till the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that that's not just a command or a prayer, but that is a promise. Holy Spirit, would you move upon us today? And would your glory shine into our hearts that we may live a life and may we demonstrate to this world who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless.